How uh, awesome of a testimony is that? Uh, I actually asked the crumbs personally, would they mind sharing that? I knew that uh, uh, the story, and uh, I asked them, uh, would they share? They they surely would not have just shared it if I wouldn't have asked them to, but I thought it would encourage and challenge all of us, uh, and it certainly did. What an amazing job. I didn't see that video until yesterday. And when I watched it, I went, uh, that is absolutely fabulous. And so I enjoyed watching it uh, twice uh, today. Hey, let me mention a couple things to you. First of all, next Sunday is Mother's Day, but it's also we have Pastor Johnny Hunt in the house, okay? Uh, Johnny Hunt uh, licensed me, ordained me, um, uh, helped us go to college. Uh, Johnny Hunt is my pastor, my friend. Uh, Vicky and I uh, go on vacation with them. Uh, we are the best of friends. He is my father, my brother. Uh, outside of anybody whose last name is Flockart, uh, there is nobody that I love any more in my life than Johnny Hunt, all right? And so he'll be here next Sunday, both services. So make sure you're here and make sure you have somebody with you, all right? No empty seats. Uh, next Sunday anywhere, all right? Let's pack this place out and because we don't want to embarrass me in front of my pastor, okay? <laughs> hey, I'm just telling the truth, right? <laughs> and uh, I mean, this is my preacher, my pastor, so uh, be here next Sunday, please. And uh, we'll have an amazing time, I promise you that. He's gonna join in in our series, the whole uh, shebang. And he said he's gonna talk to your mamas too along with some other things. And then uh, some important dates that you got to make sure you get. Okay, now, uh, for those of you that call New Season Church home, I know that's not all of you, I understand that, but for those of you that call New Season Church home, there, this is an important month. May is a gigantic month, all right? So uh, not only do we got Pastor Johnny next Sunday, but the following Sunday is May 15th. May 15th is Commitment Sunday. What we're asking is we're asking all of you who call New Season Home, what do you think you could give over and above your regular giving for the next 30 months, all right? And so whatever that amount may be, what could you give over your regular giving for the next 30 months? Because... Uh, we are trying to build a facility that costs $1.6 million, all right? Now, the following Sunday, which is May 22nd, it's called First Fruits Offering Day. So basically what that means is this. Let's just say that you committed, I'll use the $10,000 thing, uh, since it worked last time. Lord have mercy. I got to try that again to some people, okay? Man. But uh, so, uh, and I was completely joking that day, but uh, God knew, right? But uh, so let's just say you said, you know what, my family and I, over the next 30 months, we're going to, you know, give $10,000 over and above our regular giving. Well, many of you could say, you know what, I'm going to go ahead and give that at one shot. You know, I'm going to go ahead and give that $10,000 that one shot. What would that, what, if we, a lot of us did that, that would accelerate uh, this project. Now, you do realize that we are not going to break ground until we have a half a million dollars, okay? So we're not breaking ground until we have a half a million dollars. That's a whole heck of a lot of money, right? And then in that 30-month period, we want to be able to pay for this facility. So we know with the people that we have now, the people that will come one day in the future, soon, this year and the next, right, will help us in 30 months uh, pay $1.6 million and walk into that facility debt-free. Can somebody say amen and hallelujah on that, all right? Did this get cut off when I said that? Uh, so walk into that facility like debt-free $1.6 million 30 months from now. Uh, yes, <laughs> praise the Lord. Now, that doesn't mean that we're not going to borrow money after we have the half a million. It just means that we'll borrow the money to get going after we have a half a million. And then through the giving we give over and above, we'll pay that thing off. And so those are important dates. Next Sunday, Pastor Johnny. The next Sunday, Commitment Sunday. So don't be trying to skip out on that day, all right? And then the next Sunday is our first fruits offering. So May uh, is certainly uh, a miracle month in the life of New Season Church. Um, you know that I love history, right? Uh, the Rubicon River is the boundary between Italy 
and France, all right? The Rubicon River is the boundary between Italy and France. In 49 BC, long time ago, right? In 49 BC, a guy who you know his name so very well, and you even know the history of this guy, but you probably didn't know the history before, right? His name is so famous, but it wasn't at the time. In 49 BC, a guy named Julius Caesar, right? Uh, crossed the Rubicon. Now, crossing the Rubicon was forbidden by the Roman Senate. Rome at that time, before Julius Caesar, was ruled by a Senate, right? And so Julius Caesar, with his army, crossed over the Rubicon, and it was a declaration of war. The Senate had already made it very clear that any person that crosses the Rubicon into Italy, it is a declaration of war. And so Julius Caesar, with his army, crosses over the Rubicon, and he says those famous words that many of you probably remember these famous words. He said, the die is cast. Do you remember that? The die is is cast. And so crossing over the Rubicon, if you were to look it up, if you were to ask Siri right now, it would say something like a point of no return, of crossing over and making up your mind, making a decision, taking a risk, moving forward without looking back, the whole shebang. So today, we're going to look at two different people in the Word of God. One willing to step out in faith, the other one controlled by fear. One playing not to lose, which drives me insane in sports. I was watching the Grizzlies uh, the other night. You know, I lived in Memphis for eight years. I'm watching the Grizzlies the other night. And I'm watching them, and they started playing not to lose. And it drives me nuts. Do what you did to get you where you're at instead of trying to play not to lose. And so we have one guy who's literally playing not to lose, and then we have another one who's playing to win. One on the sidelines and one on the front lines. Listen carefully to me. If you let fear dictate your decisions... You will live defensively, reactionary, and cautiously your whole entire life. If you let fear dictate your decisions your whole entire life, you're going to live defensively, reactionary. You're going to live cautiously instead of stepping out in faith and believing that God is a rewarder of those that actually seek him. Living by faith is playing offense with your life. Most of us play defense with our life, but living by faith is living, paying offense with your life. So today, we're going to see one guy who's willing to take a risk, a guy who's willing to cross the Rubicon, and then we're going to see another guy who was content to sit and do nothing. Last Sunday, if you were here, I know many of you probably weren't here last Sunday, you watch it online maybe, but uh, last Sunday we started a brand new series, right, called The Whole Shebang, right? And so I'm thinking in my mind last year about what does it mean to be committed? What does it mean to be surrendered? What does it mean to be all in? And I don't know, I just I thought the whole shebang, you know, the, the whole nine yards, right? The whole enchilada, the, the whole kit and caboodle. I don't know why I like that so much. I just like the way it sounds, right? The whole kit and caboodle. I don't really know all what it means, but I just know when you say the whole, it means all in, right? Everything, right? And so uh, we're going to talk about today whether you're a cliff hugger uh, or, I mean, you're a tree hugger or a cliff climber, all right? Now watch this. We're going to be in 1 Samuel chapter 14. Now I want to give you the context of this chapter, because, first of all, I'm getting ready to read you to a story that probably most of you have never heard before, right? It's one of those obscure passages in the Bible that many people aren't familiar with it, all right? So let me give you some context. All right, the very first king of Israel is a guy named Saul, right? And so Saul, in his pride and in his arrogance, he declared war on the Philistines, right? And the Philistines, the Bible said, had an army that was so gigantic that the chapter before, chapter 13 says, that the Philistine army was bigger, larger 
then you can count the sand on the seashore. All right, now obviously that's a metaphor, but you know what it's saying, right? That's a whole lot of folk, right? That's a whole lot of big army. And so Saul had declared war on the Philistines, and the Philistines had beat the Israel to a pulp, all right? They had beat the fire out of them, right? You know what beating the fire out of somebody is, right? That's a Greek word. Beat the fire out of you, right? Put a whooping on you. That's Hebrew, right? I mean, just put something on you. And so they had been beat so bad that they ran to a cave and Saul and his army literally cowardly hid by a cave. It was so bad, the Bible says, that the only two people who had a sword was Saul and Jonathan. The rest of the army literally had to use farming equipment to defend themselves, right? So only two swords left in Israel, and now Saul and his army are at a cave, cowering away, afraid and shaking in their boots. That's the context. Here we go. You ready? I just need like one vote. Okay, here we go. Now, it happened one day that Jonathan, the son of Saul, said to the young man who bore his armor, come, let us go over to the Philistines' garrison that is on the other side. We're going to learn just in a minute the other side of the mountain. But he did not tell his father. And Saul was sitting in the outskirts of Gibeah, Gibeah was where Saul was from. Saul was born in Gibeah, raised in Gibeah, anointed king in Gibeah, so he's at home. Under a pomegranate tree, which is in Migron. The people who were with him were about 600 men. Between the passes by which Jonathan sought to go over to the Philistines' garrison, there was a sharp rock on one side and a sharp rock on the other side. And the name of the one was Bozes, which literally translates in Hebrew, slippery. Okay? So one rock is called slippery. And then the name of the other was Senna, which the root word for there is Satan, and it's the word enemy. So you got two rocks climbing on a cliff, and one is called slippery, and one is called the enemy. And so can you imagine, right? Hey, it's a slippery, slippery rock that you're going to fall, and the other one's called an enemy, which means it took a bunch of people's life, right? It killed you. And so then Jonathan said to the young man who bore his armor, come, let us go over to the garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us for nothing restrains the Lord from saving by many or by few. I just love the way that says that, right? God can do, listen, God can do through many. God can do through few. The point is God can. So his armor bearer said to him, do all that is in your heart. Go then, here I am with you according to your heart. Then Jonathan said, very well, let us cross over to these men and we will show ourselves to them. If they say to us, wait until we come to you, then we'll stand still in our place and not go up to them. But if they say, come up to us, then we will go up. For the Lord has delivered them into our hand, and this will be a sign to us. Whoa, praise the Lord. That was a fast. All right, here we go. Every Sunday, I give you a big idea, right? And so here's the big idea. Fear or faith will determine whether you're a tree hugger or a cliff climber. Yeah, I like my own big ideas. I ain't going to lie. <laughs> Fear or faith will determine whether or not you in your life are going to be a tree hugger or you're going to be a cliff climber. And so uh, let's dive into this uh, incredible text. We have, a uh, we have a contrast in this passage, right? We have Saul, who is the king, sitting, resting outside a cave, underneath a pomegranate tree, and I can picture him right now in my mind eating them seeds, right? 
He's sitting underneath a tree when he should be out fighting the enemy, right? Saul is a tree hugger. He's a cave dweller. Saul is not even in the game. He's literally on the fence. Commitment is not even in Saul's vocabulary. He doesn't want to be a part of what's happening. Now watch this. You say, well, you're being a little too hard on Saul. Well, if you'll just read three chapters later, Saul is faced with a army of the Philistines and a big old giant named Goliath, right? And do you remember what the Bible says? Saul was in his tent. He was taller, right, than anybody outside of Goliath. He should have been the first one on the battlefield, but instead he let a little teenage boy named David step up who was not a tree hugger but a cliff climber and got up there and did something for the glory of God. And Saul, scared, Hey, you can use my armor. <laughs> That's in the Bible. So he's on the bench. Every single Sunday across America and across the world, literally people go to church every Sunday. They enjoy the worship. They enjoy the experience. They enjoy all the different things that are afforded to you, but yet are not in the game. They're satisfied sitting on the sidelines. Saul is a tree hugger, and his son Jonathan is a cliff climber. Jonathan has the eye of the tiger. Come on, my 80s people, help me now. <laughs> no, 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 come on, right? I mean, all the other people that aren't 80s people have no idea what I'm talking about, right? He's got the eye of the tiger, right? I mean, he's fired up. He's ready to go. They are both faced with the same exact situation. Don't miss this. They're both faced with the exact same situation, but yet how they handle the situation is diametrically opposed to one another. One says we can do it. The other one says, I don't think it's going to happen. Saul is not in the game, and he doesn't want to be in the game. It's bad enough that, listen, it's bad enough that you're not in the game. The worst thing is you're on the bench, and you're not saying, hey, coach, put me in. Right? Hey, I want to play. I want to make a contribution. Hey, I've got, I've got some ability. i got some skill. i got whatever. God let me in the game. Hmm. But he's content sitting on the bench. Listen to me carefully. Change begins and hope erupts when you realize, like Jonathan, that God does not dwell in the cave of disobedience. When you realize, like Jonathan, that God does not dwell in the cave of laziness and disobedience and fear, God wants you to experience the mountain. God wants you to be a cliff climber, not a tree hugger. And so God is on the mountain, and that's where God wants you to be. So listen carefully. Jonathan has to make a move. You know what the problem with most people is? You just won't make a move. You're indecisive. You're on the fence. You're not, you won't make a move. You're afraid of failure. You're afraid of whatever, and you won't make a move. Some of you right now, your marriage is an absolute mess. Some of you, your marriage is holding on by a thread right now. Some of you, listen, your marriage is heading for divorce if you don't make a move. You got to make a move. You got to take that step. You got to do something. Some of you got a family situation. You got to make a move. Some of you got a financial mess, and you're in that mess because you're not making a move. Make a move. Make a decision. Every single thing starts through a step of faith. It's the moment in your life when you're sick and tired of being sick and tired, where I'm finally got to make a move. And it, steps, it starts with a step of faith. Watch this. Between the passes by which Jonathan sought to go over the Philistines' garrison, there was a sharp rock on one side, a sharp rock on the other. And then I told you the name of them, right? Now watch this. Jonathan did the unthinkable 
to accomplish the impossible. When you say it can't be done, normally some other folks are already doing it. Right? I mean, Jonathan says, you know what? I believe that God has put in my heart that the Philistines are the enemy and we need to step out in faith and we need to do something because my daddy is underneath a tree eating some seeds when he should be out here leading us to fight the Philistines. Mm. Now, I'm not really sure what is more dangerous, fighting, facing the Philistines or climbing a cliff, right? But he does it. He does the unthinkable to accomplish the impossible. When everybody else thinks it cannot happen, you can make it happen because with God's on your side, you can do anything and everything. Can you imagine? I, I've, I've uh, done a little a long time ago cliff climbing, but it takes a lot of strength. Okay, back in these days, there was no, you know, stuff, right? I mean, there's no, you know, hooking yourself in, right? I mean, so it, it, it's exhausting, right? And so not everybody is the, the Tom Cruise, right? Not everybody can do that. And so, these, so he's getting ready to have to fight the Philistines after he's climbed a cliff that is extremely slippery and a lot of people have died trying to do it. It's a picture of what commitment looks like, right? It's the difference between letting things happen in your life and actually making things happen. See, most people just sit back and wait for things to happen while others actually go and make something happen. Some people literally are tree huggers and some people are cliff climbers. Now watch this. Then Jonathan said, very well, let us cross over to these men and I will show ourselves to them. If they say, hey, wait till we come to you, we'll stand still in our place and not go to them. But if they say, come up to us, then we'll go up for the Lord have delivered them into our hand. And this will be a sign. Do you know how crazy Jonathan is? Right? I mean, he, he's crazy. But see, that's what faith does, right? How many of you know, I know it really, really well. How many of you know the difference or the fine line, I should say, between faith and stupidity? Come on, right? I mean, I have been on that line so many times, and you don't know, right? Hey, is this a step of faith or is this a step of stupidity? I, I don't really know because they look so much alike. And so Jonathan, he's, it looks like he's crazy, man. Let's, let's go climb a cliff and let's go face an enemy that's so big, the seashore sand can't even number them. It's so big. Huh. And so here's what he does. I love this. He says, hey, God, can you give us a sign? Come on. Has anybody ever asked God for a sign? Come on. Don't be honest. You ain't asked God for a sign? God, if you could just give me a sign, let me know what the heck I'm doing. Come on, right? Or should I do this? Every one of us probably at one time have said, God, please give me a sign. In the Bible, we got a guy named Gideon. He says, God, I want to do something big for you, but I need a sign. And then God gives him the sign. And you know what Gideon says? Hey, God, you think you could give me another one? How many of you ever done that one, right? Oh, absolutely, right? Hey, he showed you. Right? Go ahead and do it. But, uh, okay, well, can you give me like one more? <laughs> I just, I'm not sure. That's what faith does, right? Faith is on that edge of I'm just not sure how this is going to work out. So he says, God, we need a sign. When we're climbing this mountain and them Philistines end up seeing us, if they say to us, hey, we're coming to get you, then we're going to stay back. But if they say, you guys want some, come on. Okay, I'm paraphrasing. The new slandered version, okay? <laughs> or the Steve Flockhart version, right? If you want some, come get right. And so they do the sign, and sure enough, God answers the sign. They're outnumbered. They're out man. They're under resource. Listen, this is a borderline suicide mission. But that's what faith is. Taking risks and stepping out in faith 
is part of the Christian life. Tree hugging is not a part of the Christian life. Cliff climbing is. And then, oh my goodness, he gives the most amazing motivational speech on the planet. When you hear Jonathan's motivational speech, it will fire you up. You ready for this? Watch this. Then Jonathan said, you ready? To his armor bearer, come, let us go over to the garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us. Are you inspired? <laughs> you know what the NIV says? Perhaps. Hey, uh, you know, maybe, hey, listen, maybe we could maybe build a facility that's maybe, maybe just like three square feet maybe. Uh, ma ma perhaps uh, it'll work out. I mean, I, I'm fired up just reading, aren't you? It may be that the Lord will work for us. Hey, perhaps, maybe. <laughs> I love this. If you're trying to convince somebody to join you on an adventure that is very dangerous, you may want to come up with a little better speech. Perhaps, maybe. Hey, God, he might come through. He may help us out. <laughs> That's what faith feels like, doesn't it? I don't know if God's going to come through. Maybe he will. I'm going to trust that he will. I know he can, and I want to be a part of it, right? <laughs> it's where faith and courage actually come together. Faith is not the absence of uncertainty. Listen, faith is believing God's promise is bigger than my perhaps. God's promise is bigger than my maybe. Perhaps he could. Most people have the opposite mentality. Well, he probably uh, won't work it out for me. It probably won't happen. Instead of asking for a sign for God to show up, most of you say, well, it's too slippery. It must be God's will that I don't go. It's going to be too dangerous. I better back off. If somebody slips and falls to the death, we know God's done. He's, he, he's not in it. Hmm. These kind of people let fear dictate their decisions. And people that let fear dictate their decisions end up sitting under a prominent, prominent grant tree their whole life. When did we start believing that Jesus died to keep us safe? How, where do we ever learn that bad theology? Jesus died to keep me safe. No, Jesus died and rose again to make you and I dangerous and to step out and to fly. God created us to climb higher, run faster, and fly further. But we're busy sitting under the tree. Watch verse 7. So his armor bearer said to him, do all that is in your heart. Listen, Jonathan doesn't get a lot of press in the Bible, right? But Jonathan was a mighty man of God, a mighty man of faith. You remember Saul was his father. So who was next in line to be king? Jonathan. But Jonathan knew the plan of God and submitted willingly to it. My goodness. Jonathan was humble. Jonathan was David's best friend, right? I mean, he literally said, you know what? God, your timing, your whatever, I'm just, I, I, whatever you want, God, I'm in it for you. So watch this. So his armor bearer says, man, do all that is in your heart. Listen, he knew Jonathan's heart. He knew his motive was right. He knew that Jonathan just didn't want to be some hero or his name in the paper, right? He knew that Jonathan's heart was right. NIV says it this way. I'm with you, Jonathan, heart and soul. I'm with you all the way. Man, you need some loyal folks around you, don't you? 
Matter of fact, make sure you surround yourself with people who inspire you. Make sure you surround yourself with people who encourage you and fire you up. Make sure you surround yourself with people that say, yeah, that cliff looks a little rough, but with God, all things are possible and you can do it. Surround yourself with those kind of people. Surround yourself with people who will encourage you to take bold steps of faith and believe. I uh, surrendered to ministry, and uh, I went off to college. Vicky and I told you this story. I won't tell you, you, know, tell you this part. We go off to college. Uh, we have two kids, and, uh, and then we thought about it, and Vicky got pregnant. And uh, that's the, it's true fertile myrtle back there, but anyway. <laughs> So uh, my pastor, who'll be here next Sunday, he had already moved to Woodstock. And he said, step out on faith. Go for it. Man, quit your job. Do this. I mean, just crazy stuff. Just go ahead and just sell, sell everything and just sell out and go for it. So we did. But then we left. Vico, you remember this? We left. And then we came back one Sunday. And I, this is a true story. I walked up to the pastor's office. Vicka, you remember this? And he was talking to some of his deacons, right? We don't have deacons here, but anyway. <laughs> so, uh, and you know how when you're talking to somebody, right, Amanda, you and I are talking, and then somebody walks up, and I go, oh, shh, here they come. You know, you're like you're joking, right, like you're talking about them. Well, I thought that was happening to me. Because when I started walking up, he said, yeah, that old Steve Flockhart, man, I tell you, that guy, he just quit everything, quit his job, he sold his house, sold everything, don't have a dime to his name. And I thought he was joking, right? And so I got closer. He was serious. <laughs> and he didn't know that I was there. And I'm listening to the pastor telling me that I stepped out in faith with nothing, and I should have planned better. <laughs> I won't tell you what happened because I left because I was mad and went to another church, and then I made an appointment with him the next day and saw him, but that's all we'll say about that. <laughs> but I will say I didn't hang out with him anymore. Hang around people who inspire you. Hang around people that stretch you and push you and say, hey, take a bold step of faith. I'm the wrong person for you to come up and say, I'm thinking about starting a business. I'm st you know, I'm, don't, don't, don't tell me that because I'm going to say, go for it. <laughs> Do it, man. You ain't got nothing to lose. Hey, you fail, so what? I started a church in Paulding County in South Paulding. It went for six months and fizzed out. I learned some great lessons, but I tried. Right? Y'all all right with that? It didn't work out. Thank God most of y'all came back anyway. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Listen. Jonathan is on this cliff with his armor bearer. The Philistines come after him. This is the rest of the story. And he starts fighting them. He's got a sword, remember? He fights them. And the Bible says he kills 20 of them. All right? Now, him and his armor bearer together. Boom, he's cutting and slashing right, and then he's moving, and boom, his armor bearer is taking that hoe. <laughs> Farming equipment. <laughs> some of y'all, some of y'all mine went too the other direction there, okay? <laughs> he took that farming equipment and beat them, right? He's fighting and right, and boom, they're falling. And then God sends confusion among the army, and the Philistines turn on each other and start killing each other and start fleeing. Well, Saul, he's been underneath that tree. He hears all the commotion and all the noise, and so he says, hey, let's go fight. 
Yeah, you want to throat punch him. But anyway, he gets up. He gets his army. By the time he gets there, the Philistines are already running almost 100 miles away. And God did a great victory because somebody stepped out in faith. Somebody believed that God was bigger than my perhaps or my maybe. Somebody took a risk. So let me tell you what I'm asking you to do. All right, online in this building, everybody look at me. Let me tell you what I'm asking you to do. I'm asking you to drink the Kool-Aid. I am. I'm asking you literally the whole shebang. Drink the Kool-Aid. I'm asking you to, to, to be all in emotionally, mentally, and spiritually. I'm asking you to help us do something that's bigger than ourselves, but, but what we can do together for the glory of God and reach people. Because that's why we're doing it. That's the only reason why we're doing it. You do know that, right? To reach more people. And so I'm asking you to drink the Kool-Aid. I'm asking you to get off the fence. You've been on the fence for so long. You can't make a decision sitting on the fence. Well, let me give you some takeaways. I had a whole other page, but I got to go. I got starting point, and then I got a funeral right after that. Let me give you some takeaways. If you're here today for the first time, I always give takeaways. Listen carefully. Choosing to remain on the fence paralyzes you and keeps you from moving in any direction. That's the problem with most people. You're sitting on the fence, and you, you don't want to make a decision. And if you sit on the fence, you can't make a decision, you can't move in any direction. You're just sitting there. Well, you know, my marriage is falling apart and everything is going horrible, but you know what? I'm just going to sit on the fence and hope that something will work out. What? Make a move. Get off the fence. My finances are in a big, gigantic mess. Then move off the fence and do something about it. You're a tree hugger. And you're just sitting there. Make a decision. Call. Get counseling. Go do whatever you got to do. Do it. Choosing to remain on the fence paralyzes you. and keeps you from moving in the right direction. Takeaway number two. I'm getting really good at that. You see that? Your propensity. Dear Lord, I know what I'm getting ready to say. I'm getting fired up. To ask for a miracle is directly related to how you see God and how you see yourself. Some of you don't see God for who God is. You, you talk about it and we sing about how big he is and how awesome he is. But yet deep down in your heart, you don't really believe that. He is indeed a miracle working, death defying grave robbing miracle God. He can do anything. He's amazing and awesome. He can do it all. And so your propensity to ask for a miracle is directly related to how you view God. You don't believe God can do what God said he could do because you've never trusted him big enough to let him do something big. You've never lived out there in faith and stepped out and watched God show up and show off. And then for most of you, I'd say 90% of you you, you don't think good enough of yourself. You, you don't think something inside of you is worthy of God doing some great things through you. You're God's kid. God's crazy, madly in love with you, wants to do miracles in you and through you. But you don't believe that God can do it and you don't believe in yourself enough. You can do it. And then the big idea, right? Fear or faith will determine whether you are a tree hugger or a cliff climber. Which one are you going to be? Which one are you going to be? Maybe. Perhaps. 
get out from the cave, get out from under that tree, get those seeds in your teeth, get them out, and step out. See, a lot of you watching online in this building, you're saved, you're Christian, you're going to heaven when you die, Jesus lives in you. That, you got that part down. But the part you don't have down is that you're a tree hugger and not a cliff climber. You think that Jesus saved you to keep you safe and comfortable in your little old world. Instead, he wants you to step out in faith and believe him for great and mighty things. And so maybe you've been a tree hugger for too long and it's time to quit hugging the tree and start climbing the cliff. It's scary, I know. It's dangerous, I know. But isn't it so exciting? Isn't it just like, man, I'm out there just living by faith and watching God do what only God can do? Maybe you're here today or watching online and you say, Pastor Steve, I don't even know if I'm a Christian. Maybe you're good, you're moral, you're a decent person. You give the shirt off your back to somebody, but you've never actually given your whole heart and life to God. I mean, God's got this amazing plan, right? Jesus died for you on a cross, shed his blood, died, rose from the dead, and now wants to step into your life and save you and forgive you and change you. But guess what? That takes a step of faith, doesn't it? It's a risk. And so are you willing to take it? You've tried everything else, so I'm not advocating that you try Jesus. I'm telling you, you need to trust Jesus. Trust, faith, believe. And so today, tree hugger or cliff climber, it's up to you. Let's pray together. Heads bowed, eyes closed in the quietness of this moment. Many of you in just a moment when we sing probably need to just flood an altar and say, God, I'm tired of being a tree hugger. I'm ready to be a cliff climber. Some of you may need to recommit your life to Christ, reconnect your heart back to him. Some of you have been satisfied sitting on your blessed assurance instead of climbing. It's time it's time to climb, time to go. Others of you, you don't know right now that if you died, you go to heaven. You don't know that Jesus lives inside of you. And I want to encourage you today to take a step of faith. Open up your heart, open up your life, give him your whole being and let him save you and change you. I want to help you do that today if that's you. I'm going to pray a prayer right now, and I'm going to say my prayer out loud. And if you want to, you can pray along with me. You can say it in your heart. Just got to mean it. No playing games, no fooling around. It is the most important decision in all of life. You giving your life to God is gigantic. And so if that's you today, Pastor, I don't know that if I died, I'd go to heaven. I don't know my sins have been forgiven, but today I'm willing to give my life to Jesus. If that's you, I want you to pray this prayer with me right now. Just say these words. Say, Jesus, God, I need you. I know that I've sinned against you, and I am willing to turn right now away from my sin. I believe, Jesus, you died for me. I believe you rose from the dead. And right now, I'm giving you my heart. I'm giving you my life. Thank you, Jesus, for hearing my prayer. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. We are so excited that today you decided to join us online. We hope today that you were encouraged and blessed by the Word of God and encouraged today to walk with God in a deeper, more intimate way. For some of you, you just prayed that prayer with us. You just invited Jesus Christ to come into your heart. And if you prayed that prayer and you meant it, do you realize that Jesus just saved you? Your sins just got forgiven. And that is the greatest thing in all the world. Matter of fact, the Bible says that all of heaven throws a party because you just said yes to Jesus Christ. And so we want to encourage you to read the Bible, 
to pray, to find you a, a church home that you may be involved in, or even on this online campus we've got going on here, or I want to encourage you, if you just prayed that prayer, to let us know about that. Matter of fact, you can text your response to 470-509-5139. I want to encourage you to do that right now. Don't wait. You don't have to think about it. If you just pray that prayer, text that response to us and let us know, and then we will get back with you and help you grow in your relationship with Jesus Christ. Again, thanks for watching us online.